We will come on to limit this. We will come on to limit this for, for sure. Do you miss the Navy? No. <laughs> I don't. Look at that. <laughs> no hesitation. Um, cheers. Cheer- oh, cheers. Let's cheers. have a little beer. Thanks for having me on. I don't know, I might cut it off in 10 minutes if you just bore, if you're boring me. Like <laughs> no <that>. pressure. <laughs> joking, I'm joking. That's okay, I can I run away home then. <laughs> I don't need to sweat anymore. Um, um, no, the Navy. I miss um, the pace. Yeah. Uh, I do miss the variety of life and not necessarily knowing where you're going to be in six months. I liked that side of things. Um, but I don't miss being a weekend warrior, driving 400 miles a weekend, having to answer to people who are just idiots but have got a bit of rank, not being treated like a, a normal human being, you know. You know how it is. So, no, I don't miss it. I miss it some people, my people. What did you join up for then? Uh, you won't believe this. My friend joined as a marine engineer. She was a car mechanic. So she wanted me to go with her to the AFCO, Swansea AFCO, for the interview, for a bit of support. AFCO? Armed Forces Career Office. Oh, I've never heard that abbreviation before. No, okay. the like, recruitment centre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had one yeah. um, in town, didn't they? Yeah. And, and she was getting interviewed. I was looking at all the pictures. I was like, this looks so cool. I want to snowboard and jump out of planes and stuff. Didn't do any of that. But yeah, I joined with her as a marine engineer the crack because <laughs> yeah. I didn't know what I wanted to do how old were you then 18 yeah um and she didn't end up joining she chickened out and you did so I went solo <laughs> yeah uh yeah that's how I never none of my family military I never grew up wanting to be in a uniform some people like they're born knowing that they want a life in the forces don't they some people and some people don't have a choice. Some people oh, is that what happened to you? <laughs> no, no, oh, it's not it sounded like me. there was something no, in your eyes. No, oh no, sorry, no. <laughs> I mean, um you get people who are born into a military family as ne- an expectation. And I think that's awful. Go. It's really sad. Because some well, people just aren't suited to that lifestyle but have that pressure. Yep, yeah, but there are some circumstances with, with the uh, upper middle class and, and the upper class, should we say, where you get especially the officers in, in certain army mm. units or certain circumstances and there is inheritance or an easy life waiting for them they've got money they've got jobs they can go into they've got companies they can yeah. take over but they are not allowed to do that until they prove that they are I, until they prove themselves in some way and that way has to be through the military because that's what their their fathers and their grandfathers yeah. and their grandfathers did you know, which yeah. that's quite admirable in a way yeah I guess so. There's also a lot of wealth, miserable. isn't there? You can see the people are born with a silver spoon. Yeah. So how did you end up choosing what you wanted to do within the Navy then? What, how does it work? So my sister's electrical engineer, and I thought if she's an engineer, I could be an engineer. She was an electrical engineer in the Navy? No, no just Civvy side. Yeah. She was really good. She got headhunted to go to Dubai and all sorts. She's very clever. Um. So that's how I ended up on the engineering path. I was a roofer before I joined as well. So I know I like labour. A roofer? <laughs> yeah, I really? know. Nobody believes it. Yeah, I used to love it. Not for long. Um, just love being outside and like manual graft. So I just thought, oh, yeah, that sounds about right. Joined. Absolutely hated it. Hated being an engineer. It's awful. In the Navy? Yeah. Really? Why? I only did six months, and then I transferred to be a medic. What was your day-to-day like as an, as an, an engineer in the Navy? A I didn't. Engineer? I only I did the training, and I was like, that is not for me. I'm not dedicating my life to this. Then transferred to be a medic. Because I liked, I had a taste of forces life. And I liked it. I liked the money, even though it was nothing, but it was more than I'd ever earned before. Um. So, yeah, flipped it, because medical world is like engineering for the body isn't it you find a problem you fix the problem so I transferred it over then and that's oh. went from there and then from there i did <laughs> six years as a medic but got quite bored because it was by the time i qualified you know like the periods of conflict were all over they weren't taking you overseas um when did you qualify when 20 13. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. But 
like you do your this is gonna be a bit boring talking about like your training but part four is wherever you get assigned to generally is where you stay then as a qualified medic so if we went to CLR commander logistics regiment then you'd be with the boot next then you'd go on like land ops but I got stuck in a sick bay in Portsmouth that's where I ended up staying for five six years it was quite boring so that's when I then researched and learned about ODP and and that's what I do now. So I transferred again in the Navy, which is operating department practitioner. Nobody nobody knows about us. <laughs> okay, hang on. Let's come back. Right, so, it's okay. <laughs> so where were you when you did your tra- where were you when you did your training? Which training? The first in the Navy, the first six months when you were hating the engineering. HMS Sultan, which is in Portsmouth, Gosport in Portsmouth. And that's a naval base. Yeah. I get really co- just to, just to pre-warn you. I get really confused, right. and people are trying to teach me. Okay. Navy, Navy people. Yeah. Friends uh-huh. are trying to teach me. <laughs> when you say HMS Sultan, for example, it's I immediately not a ship. I immediately no, think it's ship. not a ship. I know, but it's I know that it's not. No, that's so I have to ask, clarify. <laughs> then I know that maybe is it classed as a naval base? Yeah, naval right. base. Okay, because there's all sorts of different. It crazy is confusing. Things. It's very and it confusing. It is strange. I don't know why they do it. There'll be a reason. I don't know why they do it though. And then my medical stuff is. My first base was HMS Nelson. Again, massive. It's the naval dockyard in Portsmouth, huge. I've been there, I think. Probably. I went, there for, an, I went there for a wedding randomly. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah <laughs> oh. I went there for a wedding, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's nice. Yeah, on, the, on the camp, yeah. on the base, yeah. It was all right. Yeah. <laughs> I it was good fun. It was good fun. Good. I'm sure it would have been. I would just never get married on a base. No. No oh way. Yeah. Cheap. But yeah. they're happy. They're happy and good for them. Yeah. Well, no, it was a positive thing. I was saying it's cheap. Yeah. You know, I don't know if that. Oh no, they're divorced. You know, they're divorced. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Long time ago. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> that happens. Yeah. yeah. So, HMS Nelson for the medical training. Well, the training is tri service, so that's in Keo Barracks in Aldershot. Yeah. Um, it's absolute shithole. Are you allowed to swear? Or yeah. No? Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so you have to know. Done it. <laughs> um. Yeah, so it's army barracks. So that was the training. That's over a year. I think it's 70-something weeks. And then you all disperse and go to your relative service, RAF, Navy, Army. So that's when I went to HMS Nelson. How long are you done with the Navy before you went there and trained there? Which barracks? The Keogh barracks? Keo barracks. Keo barracks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Keo barracks. Yes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Awful. I've, been I've been on there a couple of times. I've been on there a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. Um, how long were you with the Navy before when you went there? So I did six months as an engineer. And then you went to Keo. Yeah. And then my options were to finish the engineering training, do a ship draft, and then put in to transfer, or leave and reapply. And that's what I did. So I left for 18 months. 18 months and three days, because I had to do basic training again. If you're out for more than 18 months. Hang on, you couldn't just transfer? No, they wouldn't let you. Because they you were still so in training? Well, and they wouldn't release, I couldn't get the manning clearance from the engineering branch. Why? Uh, so they were, uh, there's always been a shortage of engineers, and then a female engineer oh. as well. They want it for your numbers. Oh. So it was, they offered me a commission and everything to stay, and they offered to put me through uni. I was like, I am not doing it. Let me go. So you get your six months, don't you, to... I don't know if it's the same for the army. You get six months, you, and you can PVR. Voluntary in, release. In training? Mm. So you get a six months grace period where you can go any time. So I waited until the last day of my six months, and I was like, right, I'm off skis, I can't do it. There is a period of time, I don't know how long it is. Mm. I don't know. Um, I don't know how much it differs. Okay, so you left forces. and had to leave for 18 months. Yeah, to start the application process all again. So you were out for 18 days. months? And three days. And it was the three days that fucked me because I had to do basic again. Why <laughs> did you wait? Oh, because the application process took Yeah, just took the so application long. process. I had to do all the psychometrics, testing and fitness and all that again, even though they had everything. Well, that's ridiculous. That's when the fuckery began. Was that, <laughs> were Capita in charge then? I don't know who was in charge. I of recruitment, know. Capita. Maybe. I think they were then. Yeah. I am, um, in fact, they 100% were, yeah. They were in charge because they were Muppets. 2011 are Muppets. to 2013, that whole period was. Yeah. I remember 
going to join the TA mm -hmm. to continue my pension. That was around 2012, 2013. I'm pretty sure it was, was, was it Capita? And they, there was no, they were, they were following a process to, for my application that just wasn't, it didn't make, it, it wasn't applicable to someone who'd served before. Right. It was because I've been out a certain amount of time. They treat you as a new recruit. Oh. But it was like, it, no. And I understand some elements of it. Yeah. Other parts, I think this is fucking stupid. This, you just like so many barriers in place. You it need people to join. Nice. Yeah. You know, the other recruitment retention problems are. Well. Anyway, I digress. Right, eighteen months out. So, eight. What were you doing in eighteen months? Um. Well, because I knew that I would be going back to the navy. I really liked that lifestyle. Um, I was just filling the time. I had a couple of bar jobs. Uh, that's where I started working. Not in Ponty. In p I've worked in five different pubs in Ponty. Oh, my God. Have you ever been to the Pink? The Pink Geranium? It's like Mordor. Like going you must have a different Earth. name. Awful. Must have had a different name before. I haven't been out in Ponty for a few year, fair few years. <laughs> I love Ponty. <laughs> it's good crap. It, it is, is so good. good. Yeah. yeah, it's good it's for like all the wrong reasons. It's like going to the zoo, like yeah. just <laughs> descending down into that little village. It's <laughs> brilliant. People watching never disappoint. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I used to work in the pink, in the castle. Did you ever go to the castle? Yeah. Um, oh, that guy was weird about that, though. He would watch back the security footage of the girls and get try and get them to sit on his lap and all sorts. Very what odd. do you mean? What girls? The waitress, the bar staff. He used to watch footage back. Of the security of the yeah. footage. Just watch the girls. And he'd make them all wear skirts. I only did two shifts. I was like, that is me done. Well, the skirts is not unusual in a pub, is it? Mm, you had to wear them. That's odd. Enforcing it. Skirts or trousers, isn't it? Should be. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I have an opinion. Okay, well, <laughs> keep it. <laughs> no, I the, the, <laughs> no. If you if you look at it, it's like it's like why do it's like a uniform. Okay, so <sighs> there should always be the choice whether you wear skirts or trousers. Yes, I agree. Often yes, I, yes, I agree. Yeah, I, I agree for with the that. man's I, view and I, pleasure, I, which no, is I, exactly I, what it was for that guy. I ag I agree with I agree with that. There should be a choice. Yeah. What I'm saying is, from a for if you go from pure business perspective, yeah. reject all morality, pure business perspective, and and you're a bar owner and you you just a, you're like this guy you just said and you think hmm what what is one of the things that would help uh, increase people into my pub. People are going to spend money and drink, men, and, and keep them coming back. And I can guarantee you that if the women in that bar are attractive or and or, um, I was going to say scantily clad. We're not <laughs> scantily clad. They got the legs out. You know, it's like, but no, it's, this no is, I agree with just, you. Like, I just completely a back, agree I know, Just to back up you. my point on it. Yeah. Why is Hooters so fucking successful? Because men are it's stupid. Not, it's not <laughs> because because what? Lizards. <laughs> Lizards. <laughs> no, no means, I completely you know, agree. with sex sells. Of course it does. Men and women, men and women and women. Yeah. It's like different thing. Different things make them tick. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> digging my own grave there, weren't I? Anyway, I worked in the castle. So eighteen months, he did some bars. There's a creepy guy. Yeah. 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 Worked in the pink. Worked in the butchers. Um, the guacal. I think I just said that. And another one. But yeah, Ponty's great. So I did that. Worked in the care as, uh, as a care assistant. Sorry. Move your chair left. There you go. So when you lean right, which you do all the time, you'll be over the mic. Okay. Go Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Is this okay? Yeah. All right. I can lean now. Go on. Um, yeah, that's when I first started working in care homes as well, just to get a bit of hands-on practice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're like this. Edge with you looking you did, at the you screen. Did. We moved the mic and now you're going like this. You're moving even further. <laughs> <laughs> it's an obstruction, isn't it's it? Like, it's in my way. Okay. In my way. Sorry. Speak into the mic. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Mic one. And we yeah, care, care home. And then also did a foundation diploma in art and design because art's always been a hobby. And I'm, I've always been keen on furthering yourself, better education. Like, I knew I had over a year to wait, so I enrolled on this course in Swansea Uni. So I did that during the day, working in the evenings and on the weekends. Yeah, kept busy. Yeah, I'm. 
I, I would have half expected you not to want to go back. When you were when you went to Keo, right, mm. and you you you'd already had that experience of being in the Navy, even though it was in, in training at, at um, HMS. Yeah, that's it, Sultan. HMS Sultan. In Sultan. Um, when you went to Keo and it was tri services. Mm. What was it like working alongside the Army and the RAF? Because they are vastly different So different. Cultures. Well, I had no idea it was so different. Night I'd, and day I'd different. only known Navy. There were no other people on Sultan. It was solely Navy. Oh, and Network Rail, randomly. They did the training there as well. <laughs> 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 They're a whole different breed themselves. Um, it's a lot more shouty, the Army. A lot more animalistic. Animalistic? <laughs> animalistic? Yeah. What do you mean Definitely. animalistic? Do you think did men would just like beat their chest and shout louder to be heard rather than use common sense in a conversation? Okay, I'm offended. Go on. No, I'm sorry. I don't mean to offend <laughs> I'm joking, you. I'm joking. I'm joking. Not Go on. Not everybody, but no. just the general. Like how business is done is not necessarily... All that sensible, I found with the army. Give me an example. Oh, I can't. Come on. Oh, you were put me on the spot. Give me a. Too much. Hang on a minute. You put yourself on the spot by coming <laughs> to the studio. So uh, you must have been at. There must have been times you're in that training. You think this is ridiculous. Okay, Why? I can I can think of one Go for now. It. And I usually freeze when I'm put on the spot. So, Whew. um, we do <laughs> part of the training. You do care under fire, and yeah. you get your. Oh, uh, what is it called? Amputees in action. Mm-hmm. Amazing people, so many good stories where they dress up all the wounds, etc. And we're supposed to be, you know, with our rifles, aren't we? But they double booked the armory, so some other lads had the weapons. Oh, the amount of times the armory is part of a shit story <laughs> from, uh, like a, a, a story of shitness from the army. Well, yeah, <laughs> army was double so booked. So yeah. they had like all the pyrotechnics, everything going on. Um, but we had to just like have sticks as weapons and go bang, 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 bang. Actual sticks. And people were throwing pine cones as grenades. Actual yeah, sticks. Actual twigs. Oh my god. It was awful. I was like, just rearrange the schedule. Like, just swap the schedule out. We'll do this another day. Oh my day. god. No comment. I've never sense. heard something like that before. No, really. I'm telling you. Oh, sticks. I've heard it before. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, just twigs and launching pine cones. That is ridiculous. As a grenade. <laughs> that is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Oh, it's so funny. I just thought, like, I just really felt for these, like, casualties. They've given up, volunteered their time. They must be thinking, what is this shit show of us going bang, bang, bang? Well, well they're getting paid. <laughs> oh, they get paid? Oh, yeah. Oh, I thought it was a volunte- um, voluntary no, no, thing. No, no, they get paid. Oh, good. Yeah, they, yeah, paid, they yeah. do a great job. <laughs> yeah, they, get paid. they get really into it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, they've been through it. They've lived that experience of losing the limb. Yeah, right? they have. You know. Yeah, we had um, some young ladies as well, like in their twenties, um, from RTAs and stuff as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, goodness. It was me. great chatting with them. Mm. But yeah, that's one example I can think off the top of my well, head. Well, the idea. I, I remember my first time around the navy. Mm. And How it was that? Out oh no, you're going to give it back to me now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, maybe. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, it was in the Falklands. Mm. Went out there. It was t- it was two thousand and two. It was like twenty years since the, the Falklands conflict, and a bunch of stuff. The, we were all getting ready for. At one point, we were all getting ready for the ceremonies, parade, and all that in Stanley, and we ended up we being um, a company of b- no, s- some some blokes from a company of Power Edge. Yeah. We ended up in a big hangar. It was tri services. Everyone was there and we were getting our heads down for the night. And that is the first time ever I was in close proximity to sailors. Yeah. Oh my god. Oui. I despised them. <laughs> I despite we all did we despised Why? them. Because it, were they all fat and lazy? Because that's quite No, common. no, no. It was <laughs> th- it, because they were so far from what we were, so mm. far from what we perceived the military to be. So well, they I were mean, like, army is one thing, and then P company. They were l- well. Th- Another, but then the they Navy were like we we were looking at them out. like they were they were civvy children. Now, I remember because <laughs> you can overhear conversations going on, yeah, and even the way they were speaking. You know, it's just, it's the same as you go in a, a change of rooms of a rugby club or going mm. to a rugby club, yeah. going to old M's, and your conversations going on on there between anyone in there, male or female. And then you 
It's like doing an assessment of that. And then you go into, I don't know, um, a, a teacher's flipping staff room and listen to the conversation mm. there. Very, very, very different, different. Very different. Like from levels of voice to what the conversations are about to the way people interact with each other. You mentioned posturing and stuff you know, just now. Uh, animalistic, I think you said. But w- <laughs> So we looked at them and we were like, what? what mm. the how are these even in the military this is yeah. crazy it was so so far removed uh, yeah i despise them immediately yeah but Fair down enough. the line yeah but down the line it's like this conversation being back it's a t- completely different cultures and there's different there's different requirements yeah. for individuals and there's different requirements for teams and the way to interact but you look at the raf when i my first sort of realization of that as a mature person thinking about it years on from that experience in port stanley was so my sister is in, in the military and she she so I remember in her bedroom at her parents' place there's a poster on the wall. Oh this is when she was a cadet actually. Anyway, it was from Lynham, R E F Lynham and it was like branded like it was a corporate entity. It was it was Team Lynham <laughs> and a shooting star, Team Lynham, oh, shooting star and it was all very yeah. you know you go, Oh my god, no you're military. Yeah. What is this? gayness you know what I mean it's just <laughs> like what you can't say that yeah uh, you know what I mean um so very different that's why I wanted to ask I thought what was your what was your thought about that mm. yeah. I think of all the services having worked with the RAF that's the best one to be in it's so what, the RAF? relaxed yeah they they are civvies aren't they in <laughs> an outfit it's brilliant but so you're relaxed well, I, alone, I, you can do yeah, what you but want. Yeah, but there's probably parts of it which are not. Well, there are parts of it which are not. Yeah, you know, it's of like course. Because it's, I wonder why that difference is between an RAF and the Navy. Because I can understand why the Army is so different. Mm. It's a different thing. Like, like having to be a soldier on the ground is a different thing. Um, but I wonder why the RAF and the Navy are so far apart. Because the Navy, I wonder it's because... Maybe it's specifically to do with how important discipline is hmm. as one big factor yeah. for example discipline in the art like the, the the impact of not having a disciplined force who will do what you tell them to do without hesitation yeah. now army yeah obvious obvious repercussions there if you don't navy mm. ships obvious repercussions there if you don't i don't know i'm literally thinking out loud they're it's probably th- navy and area people screaming at me now yeah no it's it's in the navy more recently, it's definitely encouraged to have your own opinion and your own thoughts. But then my, my military experience would be very different to yours being medical. Because we work with civilians every day. So you're a lot more integrated with the civilian population. Because you're in hospitals. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and you've got um, local doctors, local nurses in, in every practice now. Almost every practice. Um, so it's and with the medical side, you're like fault finding. You have to, you can, you'll always have somebody to refer a patient on to, but you'll, you need to have your own thoughts to diagnose a patient, don't you? So that's encouraged. So again, that's our experience will be very different. Yeah, because the responsibility for dealing with the patient comes down to the individual doing it right. You're basically working on your own. Mm. Hmm, I've not done any remote medical stuff, but I've run like the treatment rooms in the bays and everything. You get some serious patients and you have to make decisions fairly quickly on your own. So why the move to ODP? Um, I always had in mind an exit strategy and that was it. So the medical world... I naively thought that you would get your paramedic qualification. And this is how a lot of CMTs, medical assistants, RAF medics, get caught short and end up trapped in the military. is because the um, qualification you get isn't transferable to the outside. Um, so the me- the as a medical assistant, it just wasn't ticking the boxes for me. It wasn't enough. I wanted more knowledge. Um, Because it's quite a, it's a a basic level of medicine. Um, Yeah, and that was it. It was a free qualification. The Navy put you through university, which is fantastic. And I wanted something to 
do on the outside. I wanted to know that I would be safe and get a, a well-paid job when I leave as well. So does... Can you not get paramedic qualification when you serve? No, not as... I thought CMT2 was... Oh, I don't, again, I don't know about the army, oh, but in the army Navy, yeah, 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 you yeah. Um, get your medical assistant. I'm not sure what... I think it's just level three, this stage you get. Keep, keep talking. Um, and you can do everything a paramedic can. I mean, you cannulate, you catheterize, you do phlebotomy, but you're just not allowed to do it on civvies, and you'd ha you just have to do all of your training again. Were you allowed to cannulate yourselves when you were when, when you were yeah, uh, we training did. teaching you? Yeah. yeah, you're yeah. not supposed to, but you do. No, we used to do the same thing. Oh, yeah. I thought it stopped at some point. So you did medical? No, team medic stuff. Yeah, team just team. Yeah, yeah, just basic team medic stuff. But we go in a classroom. And yeah, you're not supposed to, but no. I think everybody does. Isn't yeah, they? I think <laughs> it's all right with small groups, not on on mass. Some no muppets. No. Hmm. Hmm. So how did you have the foresight to, well, why, why did you always have an exit plan in mind? Because you said you wanted to join up. Said you want, it doesn't sound like you wanted to be there for the long game, though. No. Um, and how did you have the foresight to realise how people are leaving or people are leaving not have anything that's transferable? Because that's often something that people don't realise until way down the line at the end of a 20-year career yeah. or 15 you know, or fifteen years into like a 22-year career or when it's too late and they're out. I think um, I observed a lot of that. And I think I learned from other people's mistakes and not having that foresight to have a plan. Like you always have to have a plan, even if it's not necessarily a good one. You just have to feather your nest and be ready for new. I know to me it wasn't, it didn't take much thinking. I just knew that there needed to be something. Mm. And I'd seen really fantastic medics who'd had a service of over 15, 20 years, c not able to do anything. They c all they could do would be a healthcare assistant, which is minimum wage, and it's back-breaking work, and have nothing, even though they'll have done all their herricks and everything, and done incredible life-saving treatment. I just didn't want to be in that position. Mm, I w yeah, I, w I wonder why there's not... Y you would think there, sh there would be, like, fast tracks for ex-military... You would, and there, there might be... It's the same with pilots, you know. Yeah. So um, a helicopter pilot in the military, when they leave, they haven't got a helicopter license. No? They, can't, they haven't got a license to fly helicopters in Sydney Street. No. I'm really? Not I'm not joking, yeah. I've interviewed a few. Yeah, I've got, I've, I I've got no one who's a good friend as well, yeah. Well, you you would have thought that you can fly. You would be. You would have you thought it's the same. Yeah, you would have thought it's the same. Or at least there would be some kind of fast track where you go through, you'd maybe learn some things about, you know, air regulations that you d wouldn't yeah. know when you're in, or you need refreshing on to prove... You know, it's like having a it's ha like having a foreign driving license coming to the mm. UK. I want to drive in the UK. Oh, okay, prove prove you can. Yeah, but not the full drive. Oh. Well, maybe the full driving test. Oh, I don't know actually. Am I contradicting myself here? I don't know how it works. Mm, <laughs> I don't know either. But you see my point. Yeah, that is that is surprising. I didn't know that about mm. pilots because they do it as a retention thing to keep them to keep you in the forces for as long as you can. Oh, that's why you reckon it is. Yeah. That's what I think. Hmm. Because you spend a year, your training is, for the Navy side, is nearly a year and a half. The time you do your part fours, you're coming up to two years. You're competent, but then you can't be asked to leave and do all of that again when you know it all to get your civvy accreditations. That's what I think. Oh, you might be right there. Because if, let's say, if you went, want to join the med, med corps, or be a Navy and be a medic in the Navy, mm. and you knew that you could become a paramedic within two years, three years, the equivalent to do that in Civvy Street, that's college, that's university. Yeah, yeah, because you have to get all what your UCAS points that's college, before university, you think that's about debt. it. Yeah. So you go, I'm going to join up, take a risk of not going to get sent anywhere and shot at mm -hmm. or bombed or whatever torpedoed <laughs> and get my paramedic qualifications then pull the pin and leave yeah that is interesting so with the odp when you 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 can do the degree but the navy pay for your diploma 
it's a year less, it saves them money. Um, but you have to do three years return service for exactly that reason, because it's a lot of people's exit plans. Because it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Like Exactly like what you just said, going to get this civvy accredited qualification, know you can leave to a band five, band six job, which quite often would pay better than your junior ranks in the military. So it seems obvious. Mm. When did you decide to pull the when did you decide to pull the pin and leave? Um Could you not been out that long No, you? so it's, not been long at all. it's ten months I've been a dirty civvy for. Oh my god. I know. I'm new. Why did I think it was world. longer? Why did I think it was longer than that? Ten months is nothing. I know. Um so yeah, so uh, twenty twenty one, I think. 2021, I decided. Pandemic. It was, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wasn't proud of it anymore. I wasn't proud of the uniform I was wearing. Why? There, there were some personal things that happened with somebody else. So, so my ex, he was also forces. And it just repulsed me. And I couldn't, I just couldn't put the uniform anymore on anymore. And I think I was a bit too outspoken as well. And yeah. Circumstances, just, you don't have to go into it. Yeah. Circumstances getting mishandled, which you thought it should have been handled in a different way. Yeah, uh, yes, most definitely. Um, and the people, so when I got to, so I got to Petty Officer, senior rank, and I thought I What's could. What's equivalent to Petty Officer? Uh, sergeant. Oh, okay, yeah. I, d I don't know, I just thought it would be better and you could make more of a positive change and help people, but there's just so many restrictions. And you're up against so many hard-nosed people that have always done it this way, and if you try and deviate, problem-solve anything, if you deviate from the norm, you're poo-pooed, you get a bit creative with any of your problem-solving, they don't like it because you want to bring in change, it just doesn't go down well. And I couldn't beat them, so and I definitely didn't want to join them either so it just wasn't serving me anymore do you think that was an, that's an institutional problem in the navy or was it specific to where you were, what you were working in i no, i think it's in to change, yeah, yeah it's a long-standed problem and it is being addressed slowly but we're a long long way off i think the navy i can't speak for the arm um, in the raf but the navy talks a good talk about advocacy for women lgbt being current but really, it's, it's, it's not there. They talk a good talk. They've got all the fancy posters. But there is a lot of resistance to change. Interesting. And a lot of resistance to common sense as well, <laughs> I find. Why do you think that's the case? Why don't... Um, well, you get, you get people who've done a job for 20 years. And they, I don't know. They would have got promoted after 10 years. They've sat on their ass. They don't need to change. They don't need to change anything. They're happy to take the pay packet home. <laughs> Do you have, did you find that in your career? No, because I I'm just you're making me think some things here. Actually. Oh yeah, go on. So no, I did. I I joined in 2000. I left in 2011. Okay. Right. Um, but we're interested about your point there about someone who's been in for like 20 years. If you consider how different things are now mm. things being corporate or military uh, not corporate so, like socially so, so, uh, in society yep. in the corporate world corporate social responsibility for example and all these things affect military it's the mm. same thing right how different they are now to what they were 20 years ago yeah it's almost as if we're so drastically different to what we were 20 years ago compared to the previous 20 years. So the difference between 1990, uh, yeah, let's say the difference between 1980 and 2000 yeah. is much less than the difference between 2000 and 2020, for oh example. Oh, yeah. It's a huge it's difference. Non recognizable. Crazy in yeah. so many ways. Oh, kicking something, right? sorry. Kicking. <laughs> uh, in so many ways. So maybe that means that for those individuals who are in their 20 year 20 year careers excuse me have grown into positions of power and whichever unit service they're in mm. 
if they are individuals who are particularly resistant to change, predict particularly fond of I mean, change tradition and is and particularly closed minded in not wanting to um what not not wanting to accept that sometimes even if something's working well or something's working it's always been done that way it doesn't mean it can't be improved upon for good reasons yeah it means that if they've got those people then their impact is much bigger in a negative way because they are stuck in 20 years ago yeah they are stuck in which might as well be the 1500s as we are and now. it's like it's things it's worked for them all of their like their lifespan of the military so it doesn't need to change well look yeah, you just get stuck in that rut, don't you? Well, some people do. And will take change or the suggestion of changing how business is done personally as well, a slight on their character because they've done it that one way. Yeah, you know? I agree. Yeah, difficult. Difficult, especially in the military as well, because I don't know what it's like in the navy, but in the in the, in the army, a lot of the posts that you're in, the positions you go into, they're only for a couple of years, like yes. two years, yeah, and you move it on, yeah. So it's a little bit like politics, mm. where the the prime minister is only in for five years, so you know, you know that there's a very small chance that they're a really decent person who is able to and wants to plan for the country in 15 years time yeah. and the platoon commander for example you know in the army speak the platoon commander or the company commander is someone who's there and wants to make good changes for the good of that company yeah. in five years time <laughs> when they're going to be moving on in two and i just yeah. i just don't think people care that much they don't it's not something they're passionate about mm. you do get you do don't get me wrong i'm not i'm not brandishing everybody the same and you get some fantastic no, no, people yeah. who do want to make a difference, <coughs> change things for the better. But yeah, I think quite often people are just happy, aren't they, to just turn up, do the job and leave. Yeah. I like to think that's the minimal of occasions. But mm. when, when it is the case, it can have a really negative impact. You know, I'm just thinking, because you'll get, because on the, the alternative, it's quite often, you, you know, you'll get, a lot of the time, people get promoted for the right reasons, and they end up in positions of power for the right reasons. Yeah, you get a absolutely. you get a regimental sergeant major who ends up as a the RSM of the unit he first started out in, and he's been there all through, and he knows what pissed him off when he was young, and he knows yeah. what worked well when he was young, and he knows that he there are other senior ranks who he looked up to and what their quality good qualities were, and he knows the poor ones are bad qualities were, and he gets in that position, and he and he can. He knows how he wants to do things and what he can yeah. and can't change. And, and those are good things. people. Those, those yeah, are good great people. people to be around. Yeah, they're good people, yeah. They're good people. Yeah. What a, What's the first 10 months been like? Have you, any, has there been any flapping? Has flapping? There? Flapping, yeah. I was really fortunate um, when I left. Obviously, I've got my qualification to lean on. And I got a job offer paying the same senior eight salary on my first interview. Oh, wow. So there was no flapping. I finished my resettlement on the Friday, and then on the Monday I started work in this hospital. I don't love it, but it pays the bill. And I've got so much more freedom now and been able to focus on drawing and painting and the stuff that I enjoy. And it's brilliant. I love it. I love being a civvy. I'm grateful for all of my life experiences as life with life in a uniform. And it's made me who I am now. But um yeah, ten months as a civvy has been great. It's just, just it it took maybe I don't know if you found the same, maybe six months ish to relax. Cause I was always ready, you know, like on a Sunday to come back. I was on um like 24 hours notice to move for the past two years of service. So I was read, like always have a bag packed. For two years. The ODP branch is really drastically undermanned. Oh my God. Um, and then the people, so in the so Navy. You couldn't go on holiday or anything. Like couldn't get back from You had to hours. get somebody else to cover you if oh, okay. you were um, yeah, going away. But it's quite normal. But out of the, so the Navy had forty when I was in maybe 40, 46 ODPs. But then 
out of that, the percentage that could actually go to sea and were deployable was about 10 to 15. So it was always the same people getting stung with being on what's called roll two. Oh, so there's not many readiness. ODPs at all then? No, it, the branch is tiny. So I think in the army is over 100, about 120. Navy, 40-ish. And in the RAF, it's only 12 when I was in. It might have changed now. I think they're actively recruiting. So what 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 roles did you have to cover then? So if, if you if you waited to deploy, for example, you deployed. Yeah. What what is it you're doing? So each so you've got your big ships. You've got your two aircraft carriers, and you've got your four RFA ships, which hold hospice Royal Fleet, Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Auxiliary. Yeah. You've got it. <laughs> um, and they're your hospital ships. So yeah. you would they're permanently manned every day of the year, but it'll be one ODP. That's the custodian of the hospital. So in charge of all of the kit. Um, it's, it's more of a logistics job when you deploy at sea. Um, you're just in charge of all the kit, make sure it's in date servicing, making sure everything's ready to go. And the team back home are on 24 hours notice to move. So you maintain the hospital, make sure it's current in case there's you know, natural disasters or conflict and you get sent out the team will fly out to your ship to your hospital you'll have a role to a surgical team so that's your role uh. and you're supposed to just do it was f it was four months now going up to six months is your rotation and you're supposed to do one rotation every eight i think i think it's supposed to be every three years but you'd end up deploying coming back work for a couple of months and then you'd have to fly back again because it's the same people going to see all the time. Mm. And that's how a lot of people have left. I think the year I left, we lost about six ODPs, which is like catastrophic to something so yeah. poorly manned. Did you spend much time on a ship? Um, only, so I did nearly 10 years in the Navy. I only started deploying in my last three years of service because I was a shore-based medic. And that's part of the reason I wanted to go ODP as well, to actually deploy because if you get stuck on a base, you kind of get stuck in that practice. Or if you you qualify and go straight to sea, you're then a seagoing medic. Or you go and get attached with the boot mix, your you know, CFSG, that kind of stuff. Um, so only in the last three years, but I deployed every year for the last three years. So yes is the answer to the ship. Yeah, person. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> What uh, did you enjoy it? What's what's life on the ship like? Again, it's different to the normal navy because you are class as embarked forces because you get your ship's company. So when you're in the navy, if you go to sea, you you know you get your um, what they call assignment orders. You'll be assigned to that ship for three years or up to five years. They're changing it now, so. Your accommodation is on that ship. You get your cabin. You do whatever that ship's long cast is. That's what you're doing for three to five years. But our role, because we're clinical, uh, they don't want you out of practice working in the hospitals. So <coughs> you would work in the hospital for six months uh, alongside NHS, so the civvies and theatres and then get loaned to the ship, effectively. So you're not part of the ship's company, you're in Bark Forces. I've lost track of what the original question was. Uh, what has been on the ship like? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so... So in Bark Forces, that in, in, in Bark... Sorry to interrupt. No, you're in fine. In Bark Forces, insinuates... Is the insinuation that th it, it, you're on there for less time than what yeah. the company's... companies yeah, so, um, so, for example, I went to... Bahrain ended up being about five months. The embarked forces were the bootnecks for when you're seago and they do the I don't know what they do the shooty stuff and the <laughs> stuff on the on the fast boats that they yeah. they're embarked forces. Um, medical teams are embarked forces. Yeah, I think that's it. And then the ship's company are assigned to that ship and they're there for th three years, or whatever. What what do what do um embark forces do on a day-to-day -day basis because everyone the ship's company's got a role they got you've got their, their role yeah right? and their duties that they have to do so what do you do well that's the thing it is it is a beautiful thing deploying as a 
ODP custodian because you're your own boss. You have your own department. You're fully autonomous. So you do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but that you can't because so you're you, a ship. No, like, <laughs> oh, well, yeah, there is that. You've all trapped on a tin can in the ocean. <laughs> you just... um. So you set up your plan for the week, Monday to Friday, um, and do your equipment checks in the morning, answer your emails, and go to the gym oh like my twice God. a day. That sounds like a life of luxury. Yeah. So you're hated on board. You're not popular. Oh, really? Because oh, really? they're doing their first, like, you have your dirty, a dirty first aider? <laughs> your duty first aider. Um, you know, your chefs are working, like, you get eight hours rolling on, rolling off. And they're just seeing you having a great time sunbathing. Do they have three watches today? I think so. Yeah. They were on QE, on the aircraft carrier. They did, yeah. So what? Uh, don't ask me about normal Navy stuff. What's that? Really, how do you manage that relationship if they hate you? Oh, you just have to get thick skin. <laughs> there was, when I did, my first deployment on the aircraft carrier was 2019, I think. And it was the, I can't even remember, Westland, Westland 19. So it was when it went to America and Canada and they were trialing the fast jets. And it was like coalition forces with America. Um, there was a lot of passive aggressiveness. I Go was on. a junior eight then. So I was in a cabin with eight other, well, seven other girls, me being the eighth. And it would... Uh, tell, describe the cabin to me. The cabin, Okay. Um, it's about the length of... I've, I've, I've got no idea what you're explaining here, so I've never been on a ship. You've, you've not been, been on... I've been on a submarine, I've never been on a ship. You've been on a submarine? Yeah. How was that? Awful. Cramped. Yeah. Oh, I didn't, no, I, didn't, I went on to have a look. Oh. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't deploy <laughs> with it. Oh, God, no, I didn't deploy with it. No, I didn't deploy with it, no. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the aircraft carriers, the, the accommodation's much nicer than like your Type 45 destroyers, your frigates. They're tiny, teeny, tiny. How small are we talking? Well, you've got three three bunks in one cabin. It yeah, but it's the like the length. So I think they're like eighteen man messes. Okay. Some of them have like fifty odd men messes, but in that's basically sleeping accommodation, right? Yeah. Odd accommodation, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, and it's like a couple of foot in be in between each bunk, so it's teeny tiny. Oh, that, yeah. Okay. Sounds but like what, what the sub was. Yeah. yeah. But on QE, the accommodation is really nice. It's about the length of the studio. And... So about, what, 10 foot, 15 foot? Yeah. Foot. yeah go on. You'd have a TV, which is all right. And then you've got beds either side. So two here, two here, and then times it again. But they're like full-size single mattresses, which is unheard of for a ship. Oh, it's really, really nice. Yeah, it's quite roomy. And you've got your noise counselling, counselling curtain <laughs> that you put over. Noise so you've got counselling <laughs> curtain. It's not, it's not at all. It's just awful. But <laughs> when you want your privacy, you tuck it over. But do they call it a noise counselling yeah. curtain? <laughs> <laughs> What's that covering? Yourself. Oh, so you've got your a bit bed. of privacy. Oh yeah, God. your bed. Oh, I got it. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. I'm doing a terrible job. I was thinking, is that covering like the window or something? The <laughs> I didn't window. Know about <laughs> noise counselling curtain. No, you, you don't oh, get yeah. windows unless you're the captain. Yeah, that's the that's the thing with those situations. Zero, zero no, privacy. You're always awful. around people. You, I mean, you say it's awful. I, <laughs> it's all right for the first couple of months, but when you get into the end of it, end end of a deployment, you want to, I don't know. Yeah, well you get, you, yeah, you, you get, you get. I mean, it is something you grow to get used to. Right? Yeah. I was talking. Who I talked to recently about Big Brother, mm. and people say, "Oh, go on, Big Brother, and do that," and they don't realize how difficult a situation is. You are going into a situation. Yeah, it looks cool. All these people. Now you're going in. There's no one else. You can't get away from these people. Mm. Like Big Brother, you're going in as an individual. You are not getting away from anyone else um, until the end of the show, unless yeah. you unless you get voted out or whatever. But you can't go and find your quiet time and get no. the fuck away from people. And that is something that most civvies, most people, don't understand how hard that. How hard yeah. that is. It's the same with the ship. It's the same very often with many different parts of the military of the services. You just you're confined with people. You have to be around them. You don't yeah. have a choice. And you don't get to pick the personalities you're with. And you have to That's get along with them because you are with them for a reason. There's yeah. an objective, there's a mission, there's an aim. Yeah. You know, there's a service you've got to provide. Oh, Nightmare. Yeah. Nightmare. Yeah, it does get hard. 
did get hard. I look back now and I think, how on earth did I do that? I couldn't bear to be around that many people now. How how um how many rules get bent on a, on a ship oh, when you're at sea? <laughs> oh, so many. I'm gonna say because yeah. if you're like in a, it's a if you you could end up on a ship which is like a particular culture and or let's go back to that traditional mindset. Yeah. You know, and the the captain or the uh, what they call the what they call the equivalent of RSM XO yeah, yeah. XO w- could be an absolute nightmare. And be throwing that equality book out the window. Mm. For example, for example, you know, just a whole, th- just a, a cre- cre- nightmare, nightmare time. How do you get punished when you fuck up on a ship? How do you get punished? You've got your different tiers. Um, what do you mean? Like depending on how, what, like depending on how bad the severity. Yeah, yeah. you've been. How naughty you've been will depend on if it, it's just a divisional issue. You get your MAAs, which is, is that like minor administri- administrative action, action okay. <laughs> which is like your yeah, guy, isn't it? Yeah, agai, yeah. Um, yeah. And then it'll go up to captain's table, so you'll be presented in front of the captain of the ship, and they'll decide what to do oh, with that's you. Oh, the most severe one. Yes, yeah. Um, so you'll either get returned to unit or fined or whatever else, get your rank taken off you. Depends on what you maybe been up to there's a lot of fighting on the last one i was on Why on the that? aircraft carrier Why is that? oh well it was the will tour on the ship but it was covid so people had seven or eight months trapped on this tin can and people had volunteered for this and got assigned it's to that before ship. you got on yeah 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 um yeah i was on that deployment for the second half uh, but all it was sold as it was going to be this monumental, incredible deployment where you'd get to see Japan, India, Singapore. When did it start? When did it start? Pre-pandemic. Must no, it was the it was the height of the pandemic because there were talks of the whole thing being cancelled. Yeah. Um, so people were stuck on the ship, but the the gyms were shut, so natural like outlets. Of all this aggression, you even couldn't go. On the, even on the ship, you on do the that. ship, they had one-way systems on the ship. Why? It's a closed mask. unit, though. Is this this isolated? is a great question. Why were they doing that? So you know, we were talking about earlier. Common sense does not prevail. It's one person making a decision. So on we that ship, on that nurses. ship, no one's got COVID, and they're still putting all those rules in place. But then COVID got on the ship. How? It, I think it was one of the deploy, one of the run ashores. They went to Spain quite early on or Italy and a couple of people brought it back on and then when it's on it's gonna spread isn't it oh wow um but then they were trying to I'm surprised they were allowed to run ashore when when that was going on yeah I think I think they needed it I think it was about a month in I could be talking rubbish with my dates but I think they needed it because the gyms were shut it was staggered when you could go to the galley to eat the shops were shut so it was really restricted. Shops. The sh- <laughs> shops. 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 Shop her. Shop her and vending machines. You need to elaborate on this shop. <laughs> Go on. Naffy. You're not helping yourself with my you, opinion you of the Navy. <laughs> shop. It what was a shop. Amazing. Yeah. Again, like, I've been lucky because I could only go on the big ships because of the hospital capability. Yeah. So I've been spoiled with my ship life. Um, but yeah, the QE and the Prince of Wales, the other aircraft carrier, have like a full-on post office-sized shop. Okay, They've this, got this makes, RFA it makes sense staff. to me that you would need it. Yeah. Right? So oh, well, I think at full capacity is about 1,600 people. When you when you said shops, <laughs> yeah. I literally, what flashed in front oh, of my no, eyes was like, like a parade. <laughs> you go no. down some corridor and you no. got dominoes. And you've got, you know, I don't know, W. H. Smiths, and you've got, oh, go American on. aircraft carriers have got McDonald's and KFCs and stuff on Jesus them. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Let's, don't try and distract me. Go no, on, no, come no, back no. to the shop. <laughs> come back to the shop. Come. Well, no, the, all of the things that meant that you could, all of your free will and choices of what you could do and have was all taken off because of COVID. They shut everything down. Hang on. I'm asking about the shop. <laughs> 
Tell me about the shop. <laughs> what was the shop you bought all this out? Um, noodles. <laughs> okay, like a naffy. Like yeah, a naffy. it was a naffy. All right, okay. Yeah. 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 All right. I'll accept that. Maybe I should have liked it. Is it run by that. civvies? I think there were RFA that were running it. <coughs> but then there was also uh, a cafe there as well. That was run by civvies. Okay. Coffee machines and everything. The Haven. Yeah. But again, that was shut. You not get that on the older ships then? Not, no, not one that I've not ones that I've been on. Do you get issued toothpaste and stuff? No, you have to get your own. You have to buy your own. Mm. That's a bit bonkers. I didn't think that'd be the case. Do you get issued toothpaste? Do you no. say test or tooth? No, but that's a good point. That's a good point. No, you don't get issued toothpaste. <laughs> no, but you would think that when you. De- I'm just thinking about it now. If you deploy mm. on an operation, I'm thinking army wise on yeah. an operation, you should you should be given everything you need to complete that you should. task. That, mm. that is actually health and safety law as well. Mm. <laughs> in my, uh, I did have a previous career as a health and safety manager. I won't really? go into that, but I know the ins and outs. Yes, so you should be provided everything you need to complete the yeah. task. So you should get toothpaste. Mm. That's interesting because you get given low, sh- like you get given. Inset repair. Oh, that awful. You get given. Stuff. Did you get the same stuff? Yeah, that s- sun cream is well. factor thirty that yeah. stays on and your body for about six weeks. Was it the green weeks? bottle? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <A little> awful. <laughs> yeah, shocking. <coughs> yeah. Um, no, the only thing we got issued was vitamin D tablets because we were when the aircraft, were, the jets, the F thirty five jets, were flying. You weren't allowed up, and for some periods of time, it would be three to five weeks. If the F thirty fives were flying, because they're so loud, because of the noise pollution, you're not allowed out, so you will not. It's like being on a submarine; you don't see the light of day for weeks on end. Oh, that's not good. Yeah. Did you, were you um, were you did you have anything to do with maintaining the the health of the people on board generally? So you you've got your role one and your role two for medical. So your role one is your primary care. So that's your medics. Your GP, you got your nurses and your dentist, but <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> but role two, you're there for life and limb saving surgery. So no, personally no. Again, that's another reason it was quite cushy, mm. unless anything was happening, like emergency wise. But were you quite pally with the role ones? No, they hated us. Oh why? We had a full surgical team. So a roll one's part of ship's company? Yes. Okay, right, go on. Okay. Yeah, so that's part of the reason okay. they don't like you. They see, they forget all of the NHS shifts you have to do and it's graft. They forget that. Um, so when you go on deployment, it's almost like a little break. People are going to hate me for saying this. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to hate me. I'm going to have a hate mail coming my way. <laughs> but deployment was a lovely little break from oh the my NHS. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so, no, they would do, like, your vaccination clinics, um, sick parades in the morning. They would do all of that. We would just do a normal role, equipment checks, and disappear then, unless something happened. When the when the restrictions were in for the pandemic, mm. what? how did that impact the ship? And the way it ran, and how did you see any change in the way people were, like health wise, socially, mentally? Because as a healthcare professional, mm. I suppose there'd be some, maybe something you had, you were just more sensitive to. I think being in the military makes you naturally you're like a risk taker, aren't you? And social creatures. But when the pandemic got onto the ship, everybody was a lot more isolated. And some people, they had um, isolation cabins where you'd have your meals brought to you and you were only allowed out when everybody in that cabin tested negative. So if you had a recurrence, some people were in there for up to 28 days and it had a real bad effect. Not everybody made it back from that deployment. It was awful. What? No, we had a suicide. Jesus Christ. And a couple of attempts as well. Quite a few people got sent home. Oh, my God. It was awful. And it's just not It's not how you're supposed to live your life. So one is it eight, eight, per, eight people in a cabin 
And if one of those people tested positive, the whole, all of the eight people were strictly to that cabin yeah. for 28 days. Start again. And you can't get out. Yeah, so You're in a box for 28 days. Yeah. Yeah. That would send you crazy. Yeah. Well, it did. It, I, I think this is why they pushed to have that one runner short at the start of the deployment because people needed, needed to get off. Because it's not how you're supposed to live. You're like humans are not meant to be in these cramped conditions, not socialising, not being outside. See, at least... And it's not what they signed up for either. Uh, it's yeah, not what they thought yeah. was going to happen. At least when, you know, I was locked down, I could go out for my daily walk. Yeah. I could go into the garden. Mm. I could open a fucking window. How was lockdown for you? Are you just at home, away from home? It wasn't wasn't as bad for me as it was for other people. Mm. Because of my life circumstance I explained earlier. Yeah. I, I was able to travel between two different places. Yeah. Um uh I generally found it alright because um my life got a bit simpler in yeah. a way. Which I need uh, which I needed. Um but yeah, I certainly had it easier than most other mm. people. You know, and and I did send people to Lally, even I mean, I just can't imagine that being not not having not even seen the sunlight for however long yeah. anyway. So your only concept of time is your watch. You're not getting any natural vitamin D. That in itself c- is really bad. Of course, it's really big yeah. health issues. I mean, another pe- thing people don't realise. Yeah. With it, you know, not well. Yeah, not being able to keep your, your body clock being slightly compromised because you haven't got the sun yeah. rising and setting, telling you what's going on. So your circadian rhythm gets yeah. Cramped. Circadian rhythm, you got a annual rhythm as well, haven't you? Yeah, circadian I know about your circadian rhythm. Yeah, I think it's annual as well. Oh, okay. I yeah, don't know about that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Um, but uh, so, what? How would they manage that on the ship to try and keep people sane? What? Well, what could they do? I don't know. I think this is why people really struggle. Everybody was really angry, and that brings me back to the. Um, what we were talking about, there was a lot of fighting on this deployment because people were so cooped up. It wasn't managed well at all. Then I don't know how you you can manage it. How would you plan for that? Yeah. There, there, were, there were two... It was, there was a division. There were people who wanted to just have life as normal, let everybody get it, because it'd be inevitable that people would get it and just be done, have two weeks where everybody's poorly and then get back to business as usual. And then there were people that were trying their hardest to contain it and minimise it as much as possible. And that's the route that they went down, but it just meant a constant cycle of people getting locked down in these cabins, losing their head, (laughs) and just extended the period of... I'm going to say suffering. It sounds a bit harsh, but... It it is, though. It it was. People were really sad. (laughs) Mm. Oh. Because init- it, it, there were talks of cancelling the entire thing, isn't it? Like I said, postponing it, but they just wanted to get on with it. So it was always a risky decision to send 1,600 people to sea. 1,600? Oh, I my think, God. Yeah, I think that's it. When for, the, for those ships, when it's at maximum capacity, I think it's 1,600. I'd have to Google it to so be what sure, with the rest it's a lot. what happened with the rest of the fleet? Um... I don't. I don't know how the other ships did it, because we had a support fleet. No, I mean, were they out, or were they on deployment? So were they brought back in, or what was going on? No, they, yeah, they kept going. Yeah. I suppose you got well. You got. You can't not have. Yeah. A, an able you'd have presence. your. Um, you'd have your two weeks of isolation before joining the ship, and then that ship was your bubble. So it was, life as normal. Man. Yeah, that's not good. It's sad to hear like people didn't make it. That's horrendous. Uh, awful. I hadn't even considered any, any of that, how how bad it must have been on the mm. ships until he said it there. Yeah. I remember there was a story of yeah, there was a there was a story of wasn't there video footage of a ship that was parked up. What do you how'd you say it? It was alongside. It was alongside. The ship alongside <laughs> parked up. <laughs> Get yeah. your brake on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there was video footage. They were having, they were having a, they were having a dinner, 
on the on oh the, was this a barbecue it was a barbecue there was, was a barbecue with decks. they were on the piss that on was the a barbecue. submarine yeah was it a sub down in I think it was down in Plymouth it was somewhere yeah it was here in UK yeah and somebody yeah. leaked the footage and it yeah. went yeah nuts like I don't see the issue with that don't see the issue just with that just don't have your if phone if it's in the right circumstances don't, don't have your phone, phone yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it needs to be like you can't have you can't have the, like, the same blanket rule across the board for everyone it's not going to work if you're all in the bubble in my opinion, you're on the bubble. You've all done your isolation. Mm. You're safe. You should be allowed to let off some steam when you can. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned a certain politician before mm. before us on the icebreaker. Interesting when I learned about this year, like the, the you know, party gate. So oh, yeah. The same topic. And party gate. So Downing Street was often used as a place to test new policies that they wanted new lockdown policies they want to bring in they want to see how they would impact general populace okay so w- changes either I- uh, higher restrictions or lesser restrictions for the joe public they would often test them on downing street staff to see what the effect was like more more um infections more people getting ill or whatever and um i didn't know that and uh so it was with re- reference to Partygate. And when they all got, when this all came about, the the staff, so a lot of the junior staff, they got, because Boris Johnson didn't get fined, did he? No. There was a bunch of the senior seniors didn't get fined. There you go. Thank you. Um, but the, a lot of the junior staff did get fined, where the, the top brass didn't were involved. And which in itself is really fucking poor. It doesn't surprise uh, me. But what was all. also said was that the instruction for the the party that came down from Johnson basically said, "Yeah, we're going to have this party," and it and it did fall out of line with the current restrictions. But because Downing Street and the staff knew that there was they were a proving ground for some for new or changes to the legislation, changes to the lockdown rules. The junior staff would have assumed that because it was being said by Johnson mm. that it fell within whatever rules they were under that time, which weren't necessarily what Joe Public had to follow. So they were like, oh, oh, oh that's fucking cool. Well, must be able to do it then. Yeah. As in, oh, that's fine, because the boss is go, saying yeah. it. The boss is saying it. And then, the I- not the, well, yeah, the irony that they all get done. Yeah. Sacked. They get sacked and fined, which a lot of them did. And he and others didn't. And now he's, what is it? Quarter of a million, 250 grand in legal fees that he's costing the taxpayer now. Oh, I didn't know for that. For his def- defamation of character from all of this information being released. No. It's been saying he's been framed and it's sabotaged his time as a politician. I didn't know this. Minister, yeah. When? I haven't seen this. <laughs> yeah. Where did you read this? Oh, on the news. I don't watch the news. So when <laughs> you, um, I don't normally, but it, it was an article on my phone. Just the hypocrisy is beyond. It's beyond. It makes my blood boil. So if you're, you know, working person, if you earn over twelve and a half grand, you are not um, able to receive free legal aid. But he's sabotaged his own rules during the height of lockdown. He was attending a party, but his legal aid, the bills now are cracking up to two hundred fifty grand. What the taxpayer's money? Because he just can't say sorry. <laughs> That was somebody else's fault. Dirty, dirty game. Dirty. It's a dirty, dirty game. Yeah. Um, what happens when you... What happens when someone dies in the ship? Oh, there's a, there's a whole protocol. So the reggies get involved. Uh, the what, sorry? Reggies. The police. Reggies? Yeah. What do you call them? Monkeys. Huh? Monkeys. Monkeys. Military police. Yeah. Monkeys, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a sentry. Or the MPs. MPs, just, monkeys. Yeah, yeah, they just hold the body until they can fly them home. I wasn't on ship when that happened because the medical teams get split in half. So I did the second half of the deployment. So that happened, I think, like two weeks before. But it, did it, that when it he was, fucked everyone. Did it happen when the cabin was locked down? He was... Uh, yeah, but he was on a different ship. He was on one of the supporting ships on the frigate. I think it was HMS Kent he was on. On his cabin was locked down? Um, I don't know about his cabin, oh. but he was, he was on sentry and then 
did it and he then got flown on to our ship and yeah into the operating theatre but obviously there's nothing you can do terrible really sad and he was early 20s really lovely guy yeah I mean I mean just thinking about again those circumstances those circumstances a lot on the ship just everything goes to pot yeah everything goes to pot like relationships down the pan um family the knock on effect of family who yeah. can't they may not know them with you but they can't see you they can't speak to yeah. you worried about you being on the ship their mental health all goes peat tong yeah maybe it's just not maybe normal, you're gonna be not normal what time. happens if what, what for people if we're gonna be leaving what are you are you do you end up on the ship if you signed off mm. to leave the military to leave the navy is there a period of time where you don't go on a ship like the last six months you don't you don't deploy uh example? i would have thought so I can only go on my experience. I don't know. Again, like my medical side is not the real military, so I can't tell you for certain. But I, I definitely know people who've been in their resettlement time and been paying to go on ship because the navy, like everything else, is just drastically undermanned. And when you've signed the dotted line and you're going, they don't give a shit about you. They'll use and abuse you as much as they can. They'll get their work out of you. Mm. So, yeah, I know people who have done. Whether you're on paper protected. Yeah. But the reality is, yeah, you still get shafted. Yeah. I need a toilet break. Okay, cool. And then we'll go for a break. Get the cans on. Okay. We are back. They have comfy headphones. Hmm? Do you know what these headphones are? See, there are some people who mock the size on the headphones. Okay. Because they're quite wide, aren't they? Yeah. They're Um, comfy. These are... Gamers, game. You right with that? You're Got struggling. it. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> they are uh, there for the gaming headphones. So they come with a big mic on the side, yeah. Oh, it pretty Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I bitch. just cut, I cut those off. Yeah, but they work. They're good. They're comfy. Um, right. Right. Am I sat in the right place? Now? Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Kay. So let's uh, let's let's do let's do Sophie Studio. Okay. Did Sophie Studio start when you were serving? Yes, it did. Because I've seen pictures on your. Instagram, I think, on your website as well. Where yeah. You are definitely not a civvy. You are definitely in what looks like naval uniform. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not really on a ship. He, yes. Yeah. No. So, Sophie Studio started. Sophie Studio started. <laughs> um, about October, November, twenty twenty one. Then, it was just a painting for an ex. And I put it on social media and then I had quite a few people be like, oh, I want one of these. Because it's a playing card template, isn't it? Um, so I then was like, oh, right, there's a business here. Well, but why that design? Why that design? It's just it's just something I wanted to do. There's just, there was uh, two pictures that represented me and him. And I thought it was a good way of combining these, like, two people. It's just a nice template, I thought. Um, and then I kept doing the playing cards because it's a nice structured image people know what a playing card looks like and it's customizable and it's it's so it's just an easy one to go for isn't it and you can you know add all sorts of designs come through um but i like a bit of i like the standardization of having just the card easy peasy i do lots of other different commissions of all sorts of pictures and paintings but it's predominantly the playing cards. W- but where did the art start? When did, and when did the commission start? So, so, well, so how did it get to a point where someone asks you to do art for them? Yeah. Um, so, well, like I said, it was the the initial sugar skull painting. It was a housewoman present, um, just between me and him. And oh, you did it off your own back. Yeah, yeah. Because ah, right. painting's always been a hobby, always since well, since before I joined the navy. The second time, I did that art course for a year, the diploma, Foundation Diploma in Art and Design, just because it was a hobby. I wanted to learn more about techniques, etc. cetera. Um, so it's something I've always done in the background. Um, I never would have thought that I'd be coming to this position where it is a fully-fledged business. I never thought people would actually give me money to paint because it's just something I've always done. It's just a, a, an outlet and something that calms me down and brings me quiet.
quite a lot of peace. So yeah, it just the it process. was a very yeah, it was a very organic, natural happening. When did you discover that it that it does that for you? Um I think I think just subconsciously it's been a way of like almost like meditating. But I never actively thought I'd do this to relax. I've just enjoyed it. But I've noticed since leaving the military, or my time in between waiting to leave the military, I said it was some like significant things happened, and I felt I needed to do it. That's when I realised it brings like this is actually a coping mechanism as well as a hobby, because it's the only time that would stop like the background noise, etc. Oh. So. Yeah, so I did that painting, the original painting as a gift in October, November, and then started trading, registered as a sole trader in January 2021. Yeah, it's been going two years now. That was a really roundabout way of answering that question. <laughs> no, it, no, it's good. No, it's, it, no, it's good. Um, what do you think about it makes you calm and cut the noise out? I think you're just concentrating on one thing and it's activating your imagination and tapping into your creative channel and it's expression, isn't it? Um, Self-expression. And it's just between you and... I'm going to sound really lame now. But it's just between you and the paper. Like people write poetry don't they and they journal it's um like cathartic getting stuff out so do you do it any, do you have any other creative hobbies apart from the paint or is it, is it, is it always been the art um I, pl- I play piano as well i'm quite musical um so that's also a really nice way to turn off as well you had a focus thing do you write do you write anything do you do, do you write poetry no, you say? Are you I still? Don't no i do no no why do you say it like that no, I, d- I don't mean to. I'm just not that good with words. I think that's why I paint as well, because I, like I've said before, I'm so nervous about coming on here because I find it quite stressful to talk about things and discuss things and be put on the spot, etc. But painting has been my way of communicating to others. My mum used to joke when I was younger. She could tell if I started fancying someone because I'd paint them a picture. Because <laughs> I would <laughs> never l- want to talk about anything. But I'd paint and be like, this is how I feel. This is for you. Oh, really? Mm. At what age did that, that kind of thing start? Oh, I s- I'd really paint young. things for my nana and my mum. Yeah. Yeah, like flowers and things that I knew that they liked. For my friends' teenagers. Yeah, it's just something I've never even thought that people don't do it always huh. put stuff down on paper Do you, were you afraid that when when you, t- you turn it into a business that you may lose your love of it or not I mean, you can't have been I suppose no it's just always been I've felt very privileged that people actually want to part money and I can do it as a business it's humbling what I never would have thought it would take off. But what about then, so f- funnily, what about did you realise that it would end up putting you in social situations that may <laughs> you may not be comfortable with? <laughs> e.g. podcast. No, e. never. I never thought people would be interested so you, in are you ca- Are you, because it's socially awkward, Sophie, right? Mm. What, are you, so, are you, do you think you're awkward socially? Do you find it uncomfortable in a social situation where you don't know people? I get really bad um, social anxiety. Well, why is that? Well, I, 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 I was bullied as a kid, I think, and I've found it hard to naturally connect with people, which is bizarre because when I talk to people, they always say, oh, you make me feel very relaxed and offload so much all the time. Um... Yeah, I think, I don't know. I didn't have that many friends as a kid. So maybe it stems from there. And my parents were very strict. So I was always worried about getting in trouble and not, like, putting a toe out of line. Maybe from there, I'm not sure. What were the, soci- were the 
social like anxiety, social anxiety from. came from being around people yeah and Thank like you. in your it's something that I'm working through in like counseling being on medication for uh, all of it so this is a big it's that thing. that but really it has been yeah it's something I've really struggled with oh my god I'm glad right you didn't tell me this before you came here because I would have been nervous too <laughs> I didn't even like, don't mess this up. That's what I was like saying. <laughs> You're going to destroy like, your life. My palms are sweating just <laughs> thinking about this. Oh my God. You were, until you just said it this now, uh, yeah. cute, you wouldn't have noticed. You wouldn't have noticed. Like, you. Really? Yes. Oh, I'm so even dead. off air, even off air, <laughs> your level of like nervousness. Yeah. I, would, I wasn't thinking, holy shit, this is unusual. Mm. I, I wasn't thinking that at all. Because I, I think. That's good. Most people. I try really it's definitely hard. Definitely good. To mask it. I try not to mask it. Oh, don't try to mask Well. Hmm. Well, try not mask, mask what? No, okay, no, not mask. Um, the thing is, to not To let, not let the nervousness show. That's what I try and... I try and put a brave face on and put my big boy pants on. But it, it's, it takes active work to do it. See, I don't see an issue with that, right? If, if at the same time, because people will be thinking, because my initial concern was, don't, why would you mask it? Don't, like, you, you know, you should mask things, you should just, but that's not always true. And so the way you're, the, the way you're talking, what you've been talking about there, I don't think masking it is bad if, in general, it go it helps you, progress to not having to mask it at yeah. all because there's nothing to mask there's nothing yeah. to mask you know you know in uh, in however long down the line from this point you don't have the social anxiety anymore but part of that journey was ha- needing to mask it to allow forward progress because yeah absolutely because you only grow and develop by active work you have to try you have to get out of these comfort zones to ve- to develop and get used to it. There is the classic saying, isn't there? That just be yourself. Just be yourself. Yeah, being yourself is fine if you are comfortable in yourself. Yeah. And, well, being yourself is fine if you don't have traits about you that can compromise, like, really important things that are part, that you need, that you need in life. For example, the ability to socialise. I don't mm. mean go out and go into a room with 20 people and be the be the butterfly around the room or just yeah. the ability to be okay with conversing with people you don't yeah. know um and it seems to be i, I do i think women more than men have that underlying more underlying anxiety in general that women do than, than men for a bunch of different reasons we touched on them a little bit in the icebreaker but for that elevated level that you have it can't be it can't be nice to be living with it yeah, it's it's much better now. And like like in the icebreaker, you're asking you questions and what was the advice that you'd give. And it would be to not worry what people think because I think it's quite easy with anybody who has had anxiety or feels anxious. Like some days are absolutely fine and you don't care. But other days it's crippling and you don't want to leave. What are you thinking? When it's crippling, what are you thinking? What's going through your head? Just not good enough. You're not good enough. You shouldn't. What are you doing? These kind of thoughts. That's a bit like imposter syndrome. Yeah, I think the imposter st- syndrome is real. Yeah. But what about when you came here? What were you thinking? What could possibly go wrong? Because you've listened to the podcast. I have, and it what was could possibly go wrong? really calming to listen to it because you're so friendly and so welcoming, and you made me only feel in the studio <laughs> outside of this. I'm a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Approach of caution. <laughs> And you were really good on the phone. I'm glad that we had a phone call a couple of weeks ago to talk about it, the, what to expect and everything. Well, here's an interesting one for you, right? So on that subject, because people who listen to this, don't they don't know the process that builds into a, going into a podcast. So I've had some experiences in the past yeah. right, on the podcast okay. with, with guests. I won't elaborate. So I've had occasions where I've had, I've had, ge- I will elaborate. <laughs> I won't elaborate and then I got to elaborate. Go I've on. had occasions where I've had a guest in and we've had no conversation at all, apart from maybe an email exchange or a text exchange. We've never spoken. Yeah. And they've come in and the podcast has been difficult. Really? Yeah. When I say difficult, I mean, from my perspective, looking at it from, I've done what, 200 odd now, 
from my perspective, like the, I, I look at it in minute detail, minute detail a lot of the time. We go over and review things. I know when I, on a podcast when it's going. I literally know thirty seconds in. Well, no, maybe about two minutes in. I know how it's going to go throughout. Yeah. I know straight away if it's, this is going to be a nightmare, or this is not. That must be really can, hard. It can work be hard work to keep because going you can have it. you can have people with the most amazing story. Yeah. Right? Or just or be or yeah, the most amazing story, and, and well. You know, I've, uh, you've listened to some of my interviews. It's not always people. You don't have to come on you with a story. It's where they, I'm interested to find out more about you, mm. basically. And true to life, some people can spin a yarn, some people can have a conversation, others can't. Some people can be great on paper, but as soon as you get them in front of a microphone, or never, never mind microphone, as soon as you speak to them in person, just in normal, they clam up. And then it's a problem. So... I what I do now is if I haven't if there's no if I if it's, I can't prove to myself that this person is 100% going to be fine on the mic yeah fine on the microphone they're not going to clam up there's g- we can have a conversation unless I can prove it then I have a phone call I have to have the phone that's call that's good and you've because learned from because then it's, yeah. it's like I look at it can I strike a rapport with this up a rapport with this person that's one of the things depending on the, on why the person's coming on and well that's the main one really can i strike a report and i think i can carry a conversation through yeah. for what the target is now generally i try and hit two hours when i haven't got any time constraints um so back to the point about your social anxiety like we had a phone call like you do yourself an injustice because you and i had a phone call conversation and we were chatting away we chatted away for about 20 minutes yeah it was about 20 minutes like, I, yeah. didn't, I expect it to be a few minutes i pulled over on a lay by um uh, to make the call and, and that was it but there's no need to be like you don't need to be anxious about I it. I know. It's like it's I not like this. you're like a moron who can't hold a conversation uh. or you know hasn't hasn't got something about you. You know. Yeah. And so on why on is it good, there? On good days, you have the absolute clarity, and you're like, you've got good stories. You're nice to be around. Like it's not a problem. But then on bad days, you think, oh my god, I'm just a nuisance. Nobody wants me. You're just mean to yourself. I think what people have gone. Sorry, go on. I think people who have it will like recognize that feeling as well. Just a bit mean. What are the worst? What what uh, social situations do you find the most difficult? Being around a big group of people. So I've got a few close friends, and then like parties that you go to where people that you know, you've known for like 10 years, but when you're in a big group, um, I'm waffling now. Yeah, a big big groups of people, I think, where there's that expectation to have to have a conversation. Um, and they're, they're not necessarily interested, but it's the like social norm and etiquette to engage in this conversation and you know that I'm not necessarily that interested. I know, but you just have to show face and smile and that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Am I making any sense? It does. Does, but for myself. Mm-hmm. So I, sometimes I find it. Cause I used to be really I'm nothing like that now. I used to really low self esteem, really low self confidence. R- shocking. Shocking. I couldn't speak to anyone. I couldn't maintain eye contact with people. Really terrible. Um, and now, there's some situations where I think sometimes it's just a mood. And I go, I don't, I do not want to go and be in this place. I don't want to go and speak to people. I don't want to do anything like this. Yeah. But I f- see when it's to do with something to do with a podcast or something business wise, I'm okay with it. Yeah. I'm, networking, I'm not really. Like if you go to a networking event, for example, where uh, I find those really hard. Yeah. That's like I feel like a fish out of water. I went to my first the, one. The, the worst thing in the world for me is to walk up to a group of people <laughs> and say, "Hi, I'm here, and I do this, da da da, and da, 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 and just impose myself on them, which is in the networking events is kind of expected. Yeah. At the same time, like, no, who the fuck am that I? That is the whole who purpose. To be doing that? Is to yeah, but if it's for business or a podcast or you know, we go into the HR4K event on Sunday. Um, and so there, Ben wants me to help him out with a few things. Okay. Which is going to involve me speaking to every single exhibitor there. Oh, no. Yeah, by the looks of it. Yeah, every single exhibitor there to do to do some Q&A stuff. 
but it's a band. Now, I ain't got a problem with that. Yeah. Because there's like a purpose to it. Yeah. It's not a... And it's a bit more personal, isn't it, when it's just you and that other person? Yeah, true. Yeah, true. So how do you get around the situations, in those social situations then, where you've got to go and be the person and I talk? I bring a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I bring my friend, um, Sam. She's incredible and she knows how weird I can get. So she's always my plus one. And then Alex. What do you mean weird? What freeze happens? up and not talk and I'll be going to these events for business and I just can't because the imposter syndrome is so strong. Holy shit. I think these people... What aren't gonna want to hear about me playing with paints? It's ridiculous. Why would they want to? But I am getting better. And you Alex, who dropped me off, he comes to things. Do you mean you'll freeze up in a conversation? So someone will ask you something. So I'm, hey, tell me about your paint and stuff. Yeah. And you will oh, I'll, ju- I'll just dismiss it. I'll be like, oh, oh, yeah, I just love it. I love a splashing color. What, what do you do? Tell me more about you. And just divert, like, don't want to talk about it, which is ridiculous when. Mm it comes to promoting your own business, it's really hard. Because <laughs> I think nobody wants to know. This is your silly little hobby. What are you playing at? But it's not the case. Yeah, no, exactly. Where. It's I not mean, that's the, case. the thing, isn't it? If someone's asking, if someone's asking, yeah. they're making the effort to ask. Mm. Not, I mean, I mean they're, they're making the effort to ask, not because they think, oh, I should ask. Make me feel better. They're making <laughs> the effort, you know, because they just that. <laughs> They're making the effort to ask. It means they want to know about you. Yeah. They want to know about you. I'm a nightmare. They don't want to know about you. The fact of the matter is you do something different. You know, yeah. you, you do something different. You do something people admire, you know, and uh, people want to learn more about it, mm. especially with the, your background's different as well from most people. The ex-military, very different background. Mm. The stuff you produce is different to what other people are putting out. You know, it's... Uh, How do you think you'll ever get fully comfortable with it? I'm actively working on it. How? Well, I'm, I've turned up today. <laughs> <laughs> you have turned up. I yeah, mean, you have up. that's honestly... Did it, well, did not turn up cross your mind? Yes. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? I, yeah, it did. And I think that's part of the reason that Alex drove me here, because I think he knew if he didn't deliver me to the door, I would have made my excuses. No way. I've been invited on to... I think it's four podcasts and I've just made my excuses. I've said thank you. I've I've made the arrangements and a date and just not been able to. Oh no. Just freezing up. It's it's a very real problem, but it's Oh I'm not dismissing it. It's horrendous. Oh no, yeah, I know yeah, yeah, I know yeah, you're not. Yeah. Um but it's self inflicted in a way, because of your own thoughts getting in the way. But how I'm approaching this now, um, is that I'm here to represent Sophie Studio and Limitless and like put that as a different person to me. That's how I'm working on it. So I'm coming to talk about the business, which is we not me. That yet. Huh? <laughs> we I know. That yet. <laughs> I know. How long have I been here? It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how I'm doing it. It's not me. It's the business. It's different people. That's how you rationalise, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Sophie and Bethan. Doing well. <laughs> Still we playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, goodness me. So you so the, you started the business late twenty twenty one. Yeah, I think yeah. I and think you're doing so. it at the same time as your, your day job. January twenty twenty one is when I officially started. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's been two years, two and a bit years now. Um, yeah, and it's been brilliant. But yeah, I do it alongside working as an ODP which has been too much recently. So I've managed to drop my hours in the hospital because Sophie's Studio and Limitless is gaining a lot more traction, more than I thought it would. So I dropped my hours to three days a week in the hospital and then do three days a week art stuff and then Sunday is off. But with the the goal of being self-employed. That's the goal. That'd be amazing. Yeah, it would be lovely. How do you do? How do you do your work? So, when do you find a time of day that you find better to to be creative? Um, or? It's usually the evening. I'm a night owl for sure. A lot of artists are, aren't they? I uh, don't Hannah Shergold's the same. Yeah, yeah Hannah Shergold's the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So in the evenings, 
is just when I, like, I get, like, a second awakening, if that makes sense. The brain's more creative like, I'm you. ready. I'm ready to go. I want to chuck paint down and smash a load of colours together and make something pretty. Um, yeah, so it's quite it's quite limiting with working in the hospital because the shift work shift work is the long days. So it's it's usually eight till six, seven till six, but it almost always runs over. So I'll be getting back home eight nine o'clock at night. Um, which isn't too bad now I've dropped my hours down. It's a lot more manageable because I've got the three days now dedicated to the artwork. But before, like, over winter, oh, my God, it was hideous. With the dark nights as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was hard work. But, yeah, making the right, taking the right steps to make everything a lot more manageable. Why did you, why are you surprised that it's going, it's growing? And you were able to reduce your day job hours when you also made the decision to try and turn it into a business. You must have had <laughs> some. You must have had some. Uh, uh, I think confidence um, it would take off there. Well, because originally it was pocket money, and it was just a nice to have. And for I earn over X amount, and then you have to become a sole trader. And I earn over that, and I was like, oh, okay, right. So this is a business now. It's not just a hobby. Um. And it's it's nice, yeah. I don't know. It it just ha- is a what's that artist Bob Ross? Have you seen him? <laughs> Bob Ross. Oh, and yes, he, when he Bob makes Ross. a mistake, and it, but it's a happy little accident. Yeah. Sophie Bob Ross. Studios is a happy little accident, <laughs> and Ross. it makes me very happy. But with the Limitless now, which is a byproduct from Sophie Studio and the people that I've spoken to and connected with. Explain um, Limitless. Explain Limitless. Okay, so Limitless is, so Sophie Studios all custom artwork designed, like decided by the customer. And it's, I've always pushed that it's to tell that person's story. Um, Cause like I've said, I, that's how I express myself is if I like someone or I'm feeling a certain way, I'll, I'll paint it down. Um, so that's, it's always been customized to, and, and, and affordable as well for people to have their living rooms, bedrooms, man caves. Um, one of my customers is Jack, who I mentioned in the icebreaker. He ordered one, and we just got talking, much like we started talking, it ended up being a 20-minute, half-an-hour phone call. It was to talk about some artwork, and then he was telling me about uh, he'd lost his leg, and I just made the joke, oh, you should have let me scribble on your leg. And he's like, fuck yeah. On the prosthetic. Yeah. yeah, on his prosthetic leg. He's like, yeah, why why not? So that's how it happened. Again, another happy little accident. <laughs> it's just working. It's just working. And since then, um, so that was that was beginning of last year. I've just been growing it and speaking to amputees and discussing it with them if that's a service that they would like and it's not been done yet and um you'll have seen i've got a lot of tattoos i like to express myself through it and it just to me it felt obvious that this should happen like just because somebody's you know got three limbs missing doesn't mean they should be defined by that they should be able to express themselves so Mm. hence the custom artwork straight onto the sockets of the prosthetic you're the first person in that I've seen with a tattoo in the palm of your hand, by the way. Am I? Yeah. Well, I always get asked about cool. it. Yeah, it's very cool. Thank um, you. So, did... did uh, who was it? Was it? The first guy? Jack. Jack, Jack, Jack. Sorry. Did Jack... So, what happened? Did he send you the prosthetic leg? Yeah. Yeah. He's so, he's got a couple. Yeah. Um, it's not his best one, but it was my first time doing it. It was all airbrush art. Um, so, totally totally different kettle of fish from what I'm used to um so he it was experimental for both of us um so he told me what he wanted which was a flamingo and then he just said you've got free reign do whatever you want why did he want the flamingo because they stand on one leg oh my god (laughs) he had to (laughs) he had to explain it to me as well I was like oh obviously I was puzzling I was puzzling over it that's good yeah that's good 
Um, so yeah, just had loads of fun with it, and I went to somebody else's studio and I did a course. So they this studio I went to is um, amazing body shop work, uh, skid lids. Neil uh, he's in Reading. They do. I've helmets. heard of skid lids. I've heard of skid lids. Oh, his yeah. stuff is incredible. So I booked on with him to do a two day course to just learn about airbrushing. And I took the prosthetic with me. I was like, help me. <laughs> um, I know this is really weird and it was not expected. But he oh, how did he receive that then? How really that well. He, um, he was like, I've never seen this before, but like kudos, it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was a year ago, this week actually. So yeah. it's taken this long to just raise the funds and everything to build a studio and get it ready. Um, yeah, so it, that's, that's where it all stemmed from with Jack and taking that leg to the studio to learn. And this, oh, what's his name? I think his name is Ian from Skidlids. Just embraced it and helped me go at it, get it straight on and then free-handed the flamingo. And it's gone from there. And it's been raising awareness um, for the past year, making putting it on people's radars. And people are quite keen for it. And it's quite nice now <coughs> for the artwork it's just I've always been passionate about painting and drawing and artwork, but it's nice for it to have a purpose now, which will directly benefit people. Because uh, the, the amputees that I've spoken to is quite a few. I absolutely love it, which is really nice. Gives me the warm and fuzzy. It's cool. I think up to this point, for an amputee to be able to customise in inverted commas there, there, I don't know why it's inverted commas. No, it's to customise their, their legs. It's like, well, what I would see from the people I know, yeah. amputees, stickers it's and stickers, stuff like um, that. You can get, um, oh, what's it called when they dip it in the water? Hydro wrap, is Oh, it? okay, yeah, yeah. But they're like predetermined pans that you can choose from. Um, and you can get, as well, like shin pads. That's what they look like. They yeah. clip on, so you can take them off and swap them over. But they're all very, very expensive as well. Oh, really? Again, same with the artwork with Sophie's studio. I just want to make it affordable. It's like, I'm just a normal person making normal art for normal people. I don't want it to be ridiculous. Um, and that's the same avenue I'm going down with Limitless, just making it affordable. Like tattoo work, similar pricing, etc. So I was um, in the pub yesterday in Cardiff, and I approached a... Uh, amputee again it was alex being like go and speak to them oh it was a random amputee in the pub at the bar yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was on his own and um i was like oh fine i'm just gonna speak to him and it was i'm so glad that i did because we ended up talking for about half an hour um and it's just so sad because he he got blown up in ireland and that's how he lost his leg as in Northern Ireland? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, he was in the army. He was in his Years 50s. Ago yeah. Um, and I was talking to him about it, and he said there's something similar, a company doing something similar, but again, it's the clip-ons, and they're charging £4,500. So for a custom clip-on? Cli yeah, custom clip-on. <laughs> and it's not hand-painted or anything. It's pressed, 3D mould pressed on. Yeah. So this is... Four and a half grand. Just rude. It sounds like exploitation <laughs> to me. Yeah, yeah, big time. If somebody's. How long did it take you to, to do a? How long did it take you to do um, Jack's leg? Um, that took a week, all in all, to allow for drying time. So when people will send me their leg, I'm gonna give it a two week, or arms, whatever, um, give it a two week window to allow for all the prep, because the clear coat takes 24 hours to dry, and then you do the design on top, and then clear coat on top and buff it, polish it, everything. How does it stand up to any flexing of the material when they're wearing it? Or is it rigid? Or the socket? It's, it's on the, the socket same, going, right? Yeah, yeah, it's on the socket. For most, for <coughs> veterans, they get carbon fibre. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. NHS, it's more plastic. Um, but it's the same, it's the same process as bodywork for cars and bikes and helmets. So yeah. it's bombers. Yeah. Do yeah. You, do which do you enjoy doing more? The Sophie Studio work or the Limitless work? I... What do you not want to say? <laughs> I, li I like them both. I'm humbled by both. 
Um, I think I'm more excited about Limitless and what it can grow into because it's just going to be a really positive experience for everybody involved. And Why is that? Um, well, so speaking to this guy yesterday, um, so I, I want to grow Limitless to not be just about the artwork. I want it to be about inclusivity and breaking down the barrier and the unconscious bias that people have towards disabled people, veterans or not. There is people are intimidated because it looks different and different is scary. And it happens. And when I was speaking to this guy in the pub yesterday, he, it was so sad because he said he goes to that pub all the time. But it's the first time he's, he's spoken to someone in three weeks because people look, people stare, but people never approach him. They don't want to talk to him because it's different. Yeah. Yeah, you don't agree? <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I, I, no, I, in that, that scenario, I mean, if you're on your own in a pub, it's sad that he thinks that way. Mm. Totally sad. And he thinks yeah. that way because of his leg. But if you're on your own in a pub, who's going to approach you anyway? If you're a bloke. The blokes don't get approached. Blokes mm. do not get approached yeah. and spoken to by strangers. Women do. Blokes don't. Yeah. But, okay. but not, this is not to dismiss what yeah. he's saying. Sorry. This is not to dismiss what he's saying. Because this is, this is something that's yeah. in his head. Yeah. And he feels it's because... Uh, and if it's in his head and he feels it, then it's yeah. real to him. Yeah. Right? Definitely. Um, so does he feel like the leg would be a talking point then? Yeah, he. he and what I was saying to him is that I want to change the narrative around what it is. We can, peop, it's going to draw people's attention because like we said it's different. Mm. Um, it, it's an anomaly for people to see that. But if people see the artwork, they can talk about that, and then conversations can naturally develop onto how it happened that and just true, yeah. take the yeah. stigma away from it. Yeah. And he seemed keen, and the other people I've spoken to seemed really keen. I want to be clear. I yeah. did not mean to dismiss that at all. Oh, I was no, trying, I, I don't I, think I, you did. I, no, I can see your point. It's like, the perception of, it's like the perception of someone who's not happy about something. Yeah. And then, you know, just their understanding of it. But I, I can say, like, blo yeah, blokes don't get approached unless there's something very different about them. <laughs> and, and maybe approach yeah. is the wrong word, but just having general chit-chat, yeah, yeah, yeah. he feels yeah. like he gets avoided. It's probably whether, true. Whether yeah. it's true or not, it's it's no, his reality. I mean, so. yeah. I mean, was he sat at the bar? Mm. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, sat at the bar, you're gonna get chatted to most of the time. Mm. If he sat at the bar, someone, someone, regardless, is just gonna chat to you. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was, when you were talking just before I went in and did like uh, sabotage that point, that good point you were making. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you didn't. It's fine. Uh, I, for some reason, at the moment, I'm really conscious about what people who are disabled think when I'm walking past them based on what I I like constantly second guessing what I what should I be doing? Should I am I treating so I like what so when was it? Yesterday uh, a person pushing a lady in a wheelchair. Yeah. Down the road, and I'm walking down the road and I'm doing mental somersaults on my head because I don't want to make the person feel uncomfortable. So I'm trying to be normal. But yeah. At the same time, I'm thinking, should I, should I look? Should I look away? Should I just not look at it? So what I do is I end up just walking down the road. I'm just looking straight ahead like, like what I think would be normal. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm doing backflips on my head. I'm so concerned about making them feel different that I then second guess myself. Like, am, I, am, I, am I making them feel different because I'm trying so hard not to make them feel different? Your body language is probably giving you away. Oh, as shit. Well. Oh, I'd imagine on. they can see that. I want to know. Tell They'd me. Be, Go on. No, I just imagine uh, people would be st like people. My, my gran was in a wheelchair for 16 years and I've been the per person pushing him. And you can just spot it in my log. People don't know what to do. Really? Yeah. Go on. Yeah. But the, the, best, the best thing to do is just to say hi or just smile. You know, you know. You know, like the you just make eye contact and like do the little grin, mm. like you would to anybody else. But you can see when people are averting your gaze. You can you can just spot it. I don't That's know. That's a really good point. Yeah, because I definitely do that. I <laughs> definitely avert the gaze. Yeah. Because I don't. But do you know why? Because I don't want to look and think. Do they think I'm looking at them because they're disabled? No, I'm just I'm just yeah. I'm just walking down. I've got no issue. The fact but, that you're thinking it is good and you're self-aware, but it shouldn't even be a th 
No, be it shouldn't thing. be a thing. It shouldn't just be a thing. People, it's just it shouldn't be. But, but their the life circumstances put them on wheels instead of on legs. But if, yeah, but the fact that you made a really good point earlier when you when you when you started talking about uh, the, I think with Jack, you were talking about, um, and and you said uh, people are different and different is scary. Yeah. It's absolutely right, and that's back to the point about disabled person I walked past yesterday. Yeah. I've got no issue. I've got nothing against. No, of people. course not. I don't fear them. But yeah. They, they are. And you have not that normal. C- you have that compassion. So you have this subconscious thing. Of yeah, you're self-aware, and you have that compassion because you want to make them feel comfortable. But inadvertently, you are making them feel uncomfortable. Probably doing the opposite. God's sake! <laughs> for God's sake! It's a good point. Yeah. No, but we're all we're all point. guilty of it. If yeah. it's something that you are not used to, we're all human. You're, we're all inquisitive and probably want to understand why. You probably want to know the backstory of how that happened, why they are the way they are. Yeah. But And it's only because I don't know them either. Yeah. Like how many disabled people do we know? I know quite a few disabled people. Yeah. I don't. I treat them like normal. Because yeah, they are exactly. normal. They're just like Joe Bloggs. Exactly. <laughs> they're yeah. the one in my group. Yeah. You know what I say? Oh, God. I feel really self-conscious now. No, don't. That's the last thing. <laughs> I ever want to make Rubbing anybody feel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, enjoy it. Take anxiety. Take it. <laughs> yeah, goodness yeah. me. When did Limitless start up then? So I actually launched it last week and my oh, wow. emails and LinkedIn is blown oh, really? up. It's Where did you crazy. launch? Where did you launch? Well, I don't have a website. No, but wha- um, how did you launch it then? I just told people on the internet. I was like, <laughs> on the Tinterweb? We're open yeah. for business. Because I set up a crowdfunder because I didn't want to take out any business loans or anything. I set oh. up a crowdfunder. I was like, I'm going to level with you. I'm going to set up this business. Um, but I don't have any money and I need x amount of money to get all the kit the airbrush in the studio it was a garage conversion to get the studio all the paints really expensive so it's been on people's radar for um well a year so then it was just on the social media platforms linkedin just said right it's happening finally we're doing it this is where your money's gone showed pictures of the studio which is a dusty old garage, and it looks bloody lovely now. Awesome. Um, and yeah, and people have so many people have reached out. It's been overwhelming. So you're gonna get a website set up? I am. I am. What's stopping you? Uh, it's time. Oh. Not enough hours in the day. Yeah. And I know people will be screaming, but like you make time, choose what you do with your time. But <laughs> working, and then Sophie Studio, and then I am not good with tech, so I struggle. But I've I've got it got the website domain. I just need to commit the time to do it. I'm really good at procrastination as well. <laughs> and if it doesn't interest me, building a website does not interest me. It takes a lot of effort to sit in front of a screen and get it done. Yeah. Uh, you'll see. I don't know if you. Oh, you have been on the Sophie Studio website. It's quite rudimentary. It's basic. I thought it was fine. That's good. That's good to know. Um, but I just don't put the love and effort into it because it doesn't a lot of people go me. way over the top with overcomplicating websites yeah. especially if you know if your if your prime if your primary thing is you sell things then make that just make sure that is easy yeah people because people most people go to your website because they're there because they've seen something they want to buy something yeah so if you've got a load of bump in a way it yeah stops there's it. a gallery there's yeah. a shop that's why I that's it. it there's a basket go yeah easy easy yeah. it's all you want a lot of the time all you want a lot of the time um. Yeah, I think we're gonna bring it to a close. Okay. But you need to tell people. So Sophie Studio Limitless. How are they gonna? How do they follow those? How do they? Um, how do they watch what you're doing? And how can they support you? So my main presence is on Instagram. I've got other social media apps, but Instagram is where I do most of my announcements, live feeds, Q and A's. So that's socially awkward Sophie. Um, and then Limitless is. Limitless UK, spelt L I M B, itless. Excellent. Excellent. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. It's all right. Thank you for coming. I How is your anxiety it. right now? Oh, <laughs> I am. Oh, I'm stressed. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, you've done an amazing job of um, making me feel very comfortable. Doesn't though. sound like it. You just said you're super stressed. <laughs> No, you've been great. You should yeah. do more of them. Get yourself out there. Do more of them. Yeah. Get on the podcast. Get because as painful as it is, yeah. you know, you, you, you have to promote a good, 
promote what you're doing and what you're doing is a good thing. Yeah, thank you very much. Good yeah, luck with everything. I will. Thank good you. Luck. <laughs>